worshiping and taking up your time. I'm going to get out of the way here, uh, release the bima to Elder Garrett, who's going to bring you his morning message. Shabbat shalom. All right, well, thank you, Alan. All right, well, Shabbat shalom and uh, hello again. <laughs> well, it's good to see you all. Uh, so I'll be sharing with you today. I'm just going to organize just a little bit. I'm going to make sure I put that under here just so we have enough room. All right. Well, we're in the season of redemption, both from slavery of sin and also physical slavery that was over the people of Israel in the bondage in Egypt. So the season of redemption from bondage. So the amazing thing about the season that we're in, uh, by the way, too, the, this is such a special, personally, this is so s very special this time. Uh, that's when I started learning more about the Torah myself. Um, I came to learn about more about the Torah and more about um, my Jewish background and uh, just really enjoying uh, learning Torah and learning uh, everything that's involved uh, and, and how it all fits together, even with the, with the New Covenant, with the New Testament. It's amazing seeing that, uh, seeing that correlation. And, uh, and it's been really amazing. It's been an amazing journey. I just wanted to share that personally. That's just a personal revelation there. <laughs> but uh, Pesach or Passover is a beautiful time. Uh, it's, a, it's, a it's a story of rescue. It's a story of love. It's a love story. Uh, it's a story of redemption, of rescue, and, and, and God coming for his people, keeping his promise after 430 years of bondage in, in Egypt uh, that was prophesied. He's coming to redeem his people. So it's amazing. But during the Passover Seder uh, that you guys had, I hope you all had a, a wonderful Passover Seder. Uh, and if you also took it up too on, on the second night, on Thursday night, I hope that you also enjoyed that as well. Um, so we have the Passover Seder. Uh, so you may have followed along with this a little bit. I've got, I, I gathered a few things from the Haggadah as well for this morning's lesson in case you all missed out or if you... We're like, oh, I didn't get to have a Haggadah, or I missed out. I didn't get to participate uh, in the Passover, or maybe I didn't see that. So I'm going to catch you up just a little bit to fill you in. So during the Passover Seder, Rabbi uh, Gamaliel um, taught that no Seder was complete unless it had three specific items included and mentioned. Um, these items are the Pesach lamb, so the Passover lamb, the matzah, that's unleavened bread, and moror, Maror, which is the bitter herbs. So the interesting thing about this is Rabbi Gamaliel is also the mentor to the Apostle Paul, or Rabbi Shaul. So uh, interesting uh, lesson there for you, if you, if you weren't aware. Uh, so first, with this, we have the Pesach lamb. So the lamb with no blemish in its first year. So if you see on the first slide here, I believe it's Exodus 12, 5, um, you'll see your lamb is to be without blemish, a year old. You are to take it from the sheep or from the goats. Uh, so we'll also see an interesting correlation here between 1 Peter chapter 1, eight, uh, verse 18 and 19. You know that you were redeemed from the feudal way of life handed down from your ancestors not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with precious blood like that of a lamb without defect or spot, the blood of the Messiah. So the interesting correlation here we see, the lamb is actually, you'll see also too in the New Testament, they refer to him as the Passover lamb. And that language is used several times uh, in the New Testament writings. But you also notice, too, originally, the very first Passover, you'll see that in Exodus 12. The, uh, chapter 12 is really go a good read, too. It explains uh, the other feasts that are involved, too, that, we, that, that we'll be going over, too. And we read some today in our special reading in Exodus 33. But the lamb was supposed to have no blemish. So we also see that, that a blemish is a defect, something that's not quite right or something that's a, an aberration of some sort or... Um, lack of another word, but uh, uh, something that's not perfect or pure. But we do know that from the Messiah's life, if you read the New Testament, if you've never read the Bible before at all, uh, highly recommend it. <laughs> There's a situation in every life. Uh, there is 
there is guidance and there is wisdom in this, in the words of, of Hashem. But these words, it really puts everything together here at this point. The, you see the sacrificed lamb and uh, equivalent to Messiah. We know that his, that blood of that lamb was to atone for sin, but it was also protection. So when the angel of death came over, uh, over Israel, they were commanded to put blood on the doorpost of their house with the Passover lamb, the Pesach lamb. And none of that meat uh, was supposed to be left until morning. They had to burn it up. But they, that protected them from the angel of death. And if you followed along in your Haggadah at the very end, uh, the goat song, if you enjoyed that uh, download and all, uh, it, it's kind of silly at first, but at the very end, it really pulls it into perspective. It's, it's, it's a really fun song, though, I think. I, I enjoy it. <laughs> but it, it's, it's all about prote- uh, God made a provision. Elohim made a provision for his people with that lamb that he dwelled within their homes and death rolled over them. Of course, ironically, too, we're in that time of, of plague, <laughs> pestilence uh, as well that's ravaging us now. So interesting that it comes at this time, I think. The irony. But death to Passover, uh, so so death to Passover in your dwelling. So chapter 12, verse 13, the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. So there will be no plague among you to destroy you, which I strike the land of Egypt. Uh, And I'm switching it up on you today. I'm using the Tree of Life version. So if you guys are out there following a hard copy, you're like, wait a minute. That's why. So, he says that he would pass over. So, symbolizing obedience. Uh, It wasn't all about faith. It was faith and obedience together at this point. Uh, We also see that with the Messiah, that we have to trust him, that we have to abide in him, not just to have faith, to just believe or or to say, okay, but we also have to have a relationship. We have to have action and and trust. We have to do as well uh, in our own lives when it comes to what Messiah has for us to do what his Torah dictates. But in Romans 5, 9, we'll see how much more then, having now been set right by his blood, shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? So we also see his blood is equivalent, or it's greater, because he was a righteous man. He was a sadik, a righteous one. Um, That's a Jewish term for someone that is righteous. And that's a continual theme you'll see in the Tanakh. Uh, and from a Jewish perspective, um, the death of the righteous atones for the wicked. You saw that too with the sanctuary cities. I may have said that before. Um, the death of the high priest released you from the sanctuary city that you would run to if you accidentally killed your neighbor. You know, you could run there. You could go there until the time of the death of the high priest, the righteous one, in theory. Um, and when I say in theory, what I mean by that is it's a prerequisite. Uh, it, that was the case. That was the law that was ordained by Hashem. So the interesting thing about this is the Passover lamb, the next part of this is actually in chapter twelve, forty-six. The bones of the Passover lamb are not to be broken. We also see that in Numbers as well. It is to be eaten inside a, uh, inside a single house. You are not to carry the meat out of the house, nor are you to break any of its bones. This is a really interesting correlation, and I'm following, uh, I'm, I chose John here in this case, John 19, verse 33. And you'll see a correlation here that's interesting with no bones being broken. Now, when they came to Yeshua and saw that he was already dead, so at this point he had been crucified, he had been um, ex- executed on the execution stake um, on the tree, they did not break his legs. So this was also in fulfillment of what was prophesied about the Messiah, not having broken legs or broken bones. Also making him fit, another one of the things that made him fit to be the Passover lamb without blemish. One of many. Yeshua was the Passover lamb. He went to offer himself willingly. If you see in Isaiah 53 verse 7, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, like a sheep before its shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. So that was a prophecy in Isaiah. Isaiah 53 is incredible. Isaiah 53, 1 through 12. 
clearly indicating talking about Messiah, not the nation of Israel, but it's talking about a person. If you actually look in the Hebrew language and how it's actually, what it's actually talking about, it's unmistakable that it's talking about a, an individual, not a nation. But moving from that, we have Matthew 27, verse 12. And while he was accused by the ruling Kohanim, the ruling priest, and the elders, he did not answer. So we also see, too, that that was fulfilled. That was another aspect of Messiah. That he didn't fight. He, didn't, he could have called down the legions of heaven to rescue him. As he was tempted in his ministry, in the adversary, he said, well, go and... You could fall off this, uh, this high place here and, and you won't dash your foot against a stone because it's written that, the, that, that it would not be in the Psalms. And he said, it is not wise, it, it cannot tempt the Lord. You know, and we see that case in today too. We can't take unnecessary risk. Um, and even if we had the power, we're, sh- we're shown by Yeshua's example that just because I have a promise of protection, or I have a promise that I am, I'm faithful with, doesn't necessarily mean that, oh, I'm just going to go and do it in spite, because we see that the character of Yeshua tells us that that is not the case. We also see that um, Messiah Yeshua didn't put up this fight. He went along with it. Uh, he went along with this. He didn't fight. He didn't call down the legions, and he didn't go back against them and, and quote them more of the Tanakh at that point. Uh, to try to, or try to flee or run. So that was one aspect of the, one of the three essential parts according to Rabbi Gamaliel. Um, That was essential for a Seder meal. So I'm going to stop for just a second outside my notes here. So if you're a little lost and you're like, well, what is a Seder meal? I've never heard of that before. Maybe you're a Jewish listener that didn't really grow up Jewish and you don't really know much about our people, if you don't know very much about uh, Scripture and you're interested, or if you're a Christian tuning in and you've never really seen a Passover Seder or been a part of it, but you know the correlation of the Passover lamb being Yeshua. Um, interestingly enough, the, the Seder meal is amazing if you go through all the process. I really, really encourage you to participate in one. If you can't come with us next year, I really encourage you to have one in your community. Uh, it's, a, it's an amazing experience going through the whole thing and seeing the correlation uh, between the physical bondage and uh, deliverance and also the, the bondage of sin spiritually. Just wanted to add that in there. But the matzah, there was no time to waste. They had to hurry. There was no time for the leaven to rise. They had to hurry. It's so Exodus 12, 39. They had baked matzah cakes from the dough that they had brought out of Egypt. And there was no chametz, that's leaven. Because they, they, uh, they were thrust out of Egypt and could not delay, they had made no provisions for themselves. So they had to hurry. There was no time. So we're also, in that Seder, we're reminded that there was no time. That's one aspect. The other aspect of leaven, it also t- symbolizes being puffed up arrogant. It also is equated to sin, symbolically. Uh, leaven in our lives is to be put out. In 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, we see your boasting is not good. Uh, do you not know that a little chametz leavens the whole batch? And that is true if you've ever made dough and you, and you rise or chala. Get rid of the old chametz, the old leaven, so that you may be a new batch. Just as you are unleavened for Messiah, our Passover lamb, has been, our, uh, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast not with old chametz, the chametz of malice and wickedness, but the unleavened bread, the matzah of sincerity and truth. So you'll also see there's multiple symbolic aspects to the Seder, especially from a Messianic Jewish perspective. Uh, Removing leaven of hypocrisy is also mentioned, and you'll also uh, saw this in the Seder as well. It was actually provided as a scripture. uh, Revealing uh, what is in the dark with the light. In Luke 12, 1 through 3, um, Meanwhile, when there were thousands of people gathered around Yeshua, I'm just going to uh, skim through here, Yeshua began first to speak to his disciples, and he was telling them, be on guard uh, against the chametz of the Pharisees, uh, which is hypocrisy. There is uh, nothing covered up, nor, uh, nor not be revealed, nothing hidden that will not be made known. So what he's saying here is, 
Not, not saying all Pharisees were bad, not that that term is often misused quite a bit uh, in our day, unfortunately, but there was, a t- uh, there was like Nicodemus, he was a Pharisee, and we know that Sh- Shaul was a Pharisee, and he changed his ways, but he was still was a Pharisee. He was a, he was a learned individual. He was an a- would be an academic of his day, a greatly learned person in the Torah. But that aside, these Pharisees were looking to accuse him. They, were, they didn't have integrity. And what essentially the leaven was symbolizing in this case was that's also hypocrisy is also equated to leaven. And that needs to be removed from our lives, all of our lives. Yeshua offered up his body and it was broken for us according to 1 Corinthians 11, 23, 24. The Lord also passed unto you that the Lord Yeshua uh, on that night he was betrayed took matzah And when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So when he did that, he was taking the the matzah. And we have three three layers of matzah in the Seder. And we do know he was equated with the afikoman. So that's the larger part that's broken off from the middle matzah. The smaller matzah is put back and shared later. Before I get to the Afikoman, he says that he is the bread from heaven. He is the one who gives life to the world. Interesting correlation. I didn't have this in my notes, though, too, but we know that manna came from Hashem in the wilderness, that he provided sustenance for his people, that they looked to him, and he told them specifically how to collect it, the proper procedure. But we also see here, too, that Yeshua is the bread of life. Now, interestingly, moving on with with the topic of matzah, we have the afikoman, the first matzah and the seder to be broken, and the larger the two pieces, it's called the afikoman, the hidden matzah that is wrapped and set aside until after the meal. A smaller piece is broken off and put into the smaller pocket. The smaller piece is eaten with the top matzah. After the blessing and the second hand washing, it is shared with the others at the table. In Jewish thought, this afikoman is a representation of the sacrifice that was given on the day of Passover at the temple in Jerusalem. Now at this time, uh, we will take, so at that time in the Seder, you would take the afikoman and you would share it with one another. And it reminds us of the sacrifices that were done in the days of the temple. The matzah resembles a sort of cracker, like a uh, flat, unleavened. But you will have also noticed that matzah has holes in it and it also has rows or stripes in it. And it also has brown places from the roasting, the cooking process. The matzah itself resembles something fairly mem- familiar to you, perhaps, perhaps maybe not. But if you read Isaiah 53, I have a slide for this, 53.5, uh, which reads, But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. This verse has a great deal of messianic prophecy involved in the whole chapter, like I said earlier, of 53. But interestingly enough, we see that Yeshua himself said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When, uh, when he was at his Seder with his disciples, the night he was of his betrayal and imprisonment, this is why the believers in Messiah Yeshua, whether you're a Jew or you're a Gentile, we also share the afikoman with one another. And we take small pieces of it, symbolizing the sacrifice of the Messiah for us just as he said, this is his body. Not only is this a remembrance of his sacrifice, but it's also a remembrance of his resurrection. Why is that? He brought a piece of, uh, he was bought, brought, sorry, brought before us during the early part of the Seder meal, right? So when he came to us in scripture first, but then he was broken. So he paid the price of death. And then he was hidden away in a tomb, just like the afikoman is hidden and put away. He is revealed symbolizing his conquering death and returning as the glorified king. We are reminded by him in partaking of of the afikoman together in a Seder meal. Amazing symbology, but that has been there for generations and generations. But to see that from a Jewish perspective, but seeing it in a messianic perspective really brings it to light to a fullness. So this would be done, um, of 
course, uh, passing it around. Everyone takes a piece of this. And it, it would also serve as the dessert. Now, the final part is the bitter herbs. The bitter herbs remind us of the bitter, bitter slavery endured in Egypt. They serve as a reminder of the bitterness of betrayal that Joseph experienced being sold into slavery by his own brothers. But they also served as a reminder for the grief and anguish of our Messiah. What he undertook in his sacrifice, Yeshua's heart was full of sadness that he would soon die. But sa sacrificing himself willingly, he suffered the pain of an undeserved death, uh, punishment. He was betrayed, being denied by Peter three times, as Messiah said he would. The prophecy that has yet to come, according to Zechariah 12, verse 10, in which the Messiah, and I do have a slide for that, I think, yeah, in which the Messiah returns as the conquering king in the latter days, Messiah ben David, first coming as Messiah ben Yosef, to make the down payment. But here he's Messiah ben David, he comes back as the conquering king. Then I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, a spirit of grace and supplication. When they look uh, toward whom me to, to, I'm sorry, when they will look toward me whom they pierced, they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn. This bitterness is reminded both in slavery in Egypt, the bitterness of slavery, but also the anguish that the Messiah was going through before his crucifixion, before his death, uh, and also the betrayal he experienced, and also a reminder of Joseph's betrayal. In the days of the temple, all three elements were eaten at the Passover Seder, all three of these elements. Uh, while we don't eat the Passover lamb, the roasted meat, since there is no temple standing today, we do, however, commemorate the sacrifice with a Passover meal together. We also have a shank bone on the Seder plate reminding us of the Pesach sacrifice. And we are reminded by the sacrifice of Yeshua the Messiah that made for us as our Passover lamb. And in conclusion, in Exodus 12, verse 8, it says, They are to eat the meat that night roasted over a fire with matzah and bitter herbs, they are to eat it, specifically mentioned. We also see mentioned earlier Peter's betrayal in uh, Matthew 20, 26, verse 75. Then Peter reminded himself of the word Yeshua had said, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went away and wept bitterly. So Peter also experienced... Uh, that betrayal, that, that guilt, the immense guilt that he had betrayed his master, and he said he wouldn't, not I, not me. But it reminds you also of ourselves. And that brings me to my next point I would like to make. Uh, a lot of people have accused the Jewish people and uh, those of Israel to that, that, oh, you, you killed the Messiah, or... They say, you killed the, the Christ, you killed Jesus. But yet, are they failed? So natural Israel is going to be replaced with, uh, with the church, right? You've heard this before. And maybe you believe that when you're watching this, but you would be surprised perhaps to know that nothing could be further from the truth, that it's by faith and trusting, just like Abraham trusted. That's what brought him into covenant with Hashem. And he made promises with his people. He rescued them during the season of Passover. And he also had a promise for them originally with Abraham to go into the land of Israel. And he kept his word. Even today, Israel is now a nation after so many years, not because of their own righteousness, but because of his righteousness, because of his word. And he does have a plan for them as it unfolded in the Tanakh. But we're also, my Big point with that is, aren't we, aren't the Gentiles as well, and, and, and Jews, no matter your standing, don't we also share in guilt? Don't we also share in that bitterness of betrayal as well? Can we say that we replace Israel if our sins are the same? That's a question perhaps you could ask yourselves. So why then do you think you are worthy? 
by yourself on your own inclination. Scripture tells us, though, that all are worthy that put their trust in Yeshua the Messiah that are grafted in. Uh, the Gentiles are grafted in because of their trust, because of their faith in Messiah. That's what brings them to salvation. And also the, the Jewish people that have trust are put back into their own branch that they came from, their own tree that they came from. And they're, they're put back because of their faith. Reminded about that like Abraham, like I said. And last verse I have, the grief of undeserved suffering. So undeserved suffering, of course, meaning it was unrighteous. It wasn't warranted. This person did nothing to deserve this punishment that was given to them. Absolutely nothing, according to the Torah. First Peter 2, verse 19. Uh, for, this finds fa uh, for this finds favor if, for the sake of conscience towards God, someone endures grief for suffering undeservedly. So we see that the Messiah, Yeshua, went through this. He had an undeserved punishment for what he went through. Uh, just like the Passover lamb, like I told you in the beginning, also had to have no blemish. His bones could not be broken. Uh, but it also made a covering, and a, a covering for sin. But with Messiah Yeshua, that makes atonement a complete cleansing from sin. So I reach out to you and implore you, those who are listening, if you don't know who the Messiah is, uh, if you've never considered taking this opportunity, if you've never read a Bible before, I encourage you to. Uh, if you've never taken this opportunity to come before him, it's now is more a perfect time than any. And any situation that you're going through, anything that you're experiencing in your life, it doesn't matter. No situation affects our relationship with Hashem, with our God, with Elohim, with Yeshua. We keep our focus on Him through, through the Messiah Yeshua for deliverance and a better quality of life, life more abundantly, that we can live through this life. He doesn't solve all of our problems. That's not what it's about. It's about the relationship. It's about building that trust, building that faith, just like you would with a husband or a wife. You, you build a trust and a relationship, and you love them. That he builds relationship with us like a father to a son or a daughter. And it's an amazing experience, so I highly encourage you. And if you need any resource, if, you're, if you can't afford a, a Bible, reach out to me. I'll give you one. I'll do my best I can for you. So, in closing with that, uh, we see the beauty of the, of the Seder. We see the beauty and the culmination. And I've only touched on a small subject, three main sections of the Seder, but there are many more. The symbology is incredible. And partaking out of it, of this feast, is an honor. And it's a privilege. And I encourage you as well to take, take part when you can as well. And with that, I would like to say shalom to you and shavuotov. And thank you.